Might as well start with a little bit about me. Hmm. Hello, this is all about me. Um, I started out in Linux in the mid 90s. In fact, I was new to computing in general. Back then, it seemed like most Linux users started out in Unix. Well, I was a total noob to everything. Started out with an Apple computer, and then a Windows slash DOS, DOS computer. That was Windows 3.1 and it was unusable. So I did most of my work in DOS and yeah, that was all right. I, it, it, it worked, got stuff done. And it was pretty much necessary anyway, because back then personal computers, there, there were two major differences from computing in the old days. The personal computer, you needed a lot more functionality, the, gra you know, the nice graphical interface, way more apps than a server would ever run. And, uh, as much as I really do not like Microsoft and Apple as companies, I mean, you know, anybody out there using Apple and Microsoft products, that's fine. I'm not going to get on your case about it. Me, I just, you know, they're just too, too confining and restrictive and control freaky. And the cool thing I think most we all know here about Linux and, and the free open source software world is you don't have to say mother may I every time you want to do some little thing. Oh, lost my train of thought. That's all right. See, I'm 64, so it's allowed. And that's another thing I think that makes me different from a lot of Linux users is midlife career changer. I've changed careers, oh gosh, probably six or seven times. It's just short attention span. I mean, as soon as I get fairly good at something, I get bored and have to move on to something else. But I've stuck with tech longer than anything else going on uh, 20 some years now. That's like decades. So I started on my first Linux was Red Hat 5 installed with a batch of floppy disks. And it was pretty cool. But the Linux distribution that really got me going was Mandrake because it took care of the hardware, it automatically set up as much as it could, video, audio. You didn't have to hassle with that. Um, I played Tux Racer. I mean, that was my first real introduction to Linux was games, Tux Racer and a bunch of others. Mandrake at the time, it was very popular because it was so easy to get into, but you know how the Linux world is. Everybody's got opinions about something and there's if something's too easy that makes it bad in some way so mandrake was actually was criticized for being bloated well bloat is one of two things it's either excessive code there's just unnecessary stuff in there that could be removed or it's more functionality either the computer does the work or we do the work and i am totally fine with having the computer do as much of the work as possible especially basic stuff like setting up hardware and just being able to get into your machine linux has been in a constant state of change um, anybody who's used it any length of time is used to seeing their favorite stuff be changed to be on recognition or disappeared entirely so i'm going to start with what i think are the most significant changes to basic Linux functionality. System D for starters, this is a biggie. This is really huge. The old timers probably remember the old system V init. Um, there was also Linux standard base had its own init system and BSD. Now BSD init back in the day was really cool for simple servers. It was very simple to configure, very limited. It was great. Well, times are really different now, and even servers are vastly more complicated, way more hardware, way more stuff going on, way more things to manage. And the old INITs just weren't cutting it. Um, there were static INITs. All you could do is configure what would start at boot. And then you'd have, if you wanted things to start later, like on demand, you had to figure out some goofy hack to make it go. And we had these process managers, INITD, XINITD, Demon tools, Daniel Bernstein, maybe some of you remember him, Qmail and other cool tools. So these early INITs, they were uh, initialization, initialization systems. They were pretty complex. There were these giant masses of shell scripts in all these different locations, and then sim links. And so you had so you had all these directories and 
the init scripts themselves were huge. They were all shell scripts. They're very complicated. Um, some, you know, more than a hundred lines. So when system D came along, system D is not just a process manager, it is a service manager. So that means it manages everything that is needed for a particular service to run. And I have to look at my notes here because that's just the way I roll. So it's not just opening listening sockets, it's also managing block devices, file systems, um, commands native to, to, to whatever, the, whatever services you're trying to run. And these are all configured in system D unit files, which are simple. They're just a few lines and they're not scripts. They're just key value pairs. So they're really easy to learn to edit. You just learn your key value pairs and there you go. <laughs> now I'm talking about how much easier Linux become to use. I had to switch computers to run Zoom because the one I was originally going to use, <laughs> Zoom didn't work on it and it's worked on it before. And I don't know why it doesn't work today. So computers are fun. And another thing with the old INITs, there were multiple commands to managing them. Red Hat came up with check config and the service commands. And to me, this was just another layer of complexity. It didn't really help make them easier. Well, it's all gone now. It's all system D and you use a system CTL command. The legacy systems did not do dependency resolving. So say if you had to have networking start before something else, you had to manually configure it to do that. Now we're way more, way more complex. All this stuff going on. And the beauty of system D is you, you don't have to wait for these other services to become available. All you need is a listening socket. I mean, it, it, it's great. And it uses all these functions that are native to the Linux kernel rather than bolt-ons. And system D is mostly written in C. It's a compiled language way faster than shell scripts. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has its downsides. I don't want to get into those now because system D is huge and we can talk about it for days. But that's the first, um, I think that is the most significant change in the evolution of Linux. And I will stop here. Does anybody have a question before we move on to the next thing, which is wireless, which is uh, networking. Carl, I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm looking in the Q&A stream and I'm not seeing any direct questions okay. yet. I'm sure they'll come in. Okay, well, we'll have more opportunities for questions. The next big thing uh, is the unified wireless networking stack that came, that was developed and released around 2007, 2008. Um, that was, that was amazing. If you struggled with wireless network interfaces back then, then you know what I'm talking about. There was all this hodgepodge of different incompatible drivers, the mad Wi-Fi drivers for, for Athros devices. There was Waveland. There was the um, AS Plus driver for NetWave devices, Prism devices, use, use the WLAN driver, ZCOM, Aeronet, Airlan, on and on and on, all these different things. And back then, of course, finding supported hardware for Linux was, it was, it was beastly. It took a lot of time and energy. So the Wi-Fi team, led by John Linville, I actually remembered a name. Yay, he was cool. Met him once at a Linux conference. And they replaced all of that with a common driver base. So this is all native Linux kernel stuff. And the key thing they did was they worked with hardware manufacturers to make this all work. And in fact, uh, some I think it was around that time when the kernel team in general started making serious outreaches to hardware vendors of all kinds. And they, they volunteered time and development help and whatever it needed to get these device, get hardware supported on Linux. That was really huge. And it also illustrates again, that the people side of tech is always more important than the technical side of tech. You know, if you don't have the people, you don't have anything. So, but that that was that was just about revolutionary. That was that was my favorite thing. And I've I've been 
mostly wireless only in my home office from that time. I, I really like it. It's yeah, string and cables all over. It has its charm, but I'm not sorry to not have to do that. And related to that network manager, which had a bumpy beginning, as so many new things do, it didn't work all that well. Well, you know, it takes time. You iterate, you keep improving. Um, if you remember trying to manage wireless network interfaces before network manager, it was pain itself. You had to use WICD or uh, some other other apps or other commands, I forget now. And it was it was just plain painful. And of course, the different Linux distributions did their best to make it easier. Network Manager was the first app to really make it all work. And now you have a single interface for all your network interface devices. You can have a whole herd of them on a single machine and effortlessly switch between them. Um, network Manager also manages other network services, such as SSH, Open Connect, VPN. You set it up and it's all just pointy clicky. Network auto discovery, roaming, it is, it is awesome. What goes hand in hand with all this easier network and networking management is hot plug and USB. Those were really huge game changers. In the bad old days, we had to have bigger computer cases because hardly anything was native on the motherboard. Any extra functionality you wanted you had to add expansion cards. And I think these days about the only expansion card people like to use are giant, massively powerful GPUs for gaming. Just video cards that are old and the super server. There was a time when if you wanted to change any hardware on your system, on your system even if it was just plugging in a keyboard or a mouse, you had to have it powered off or you risk doing damage to, to your motherboard. Um, now everything's plug and play. It doesn't matter. You just plug it in and go and you don't have to worry about if your computer's on or off. You're not going to blow it up. It's great. You can just, you know, no must, no fuss. In fact, the only limitations now on plug and play are bad apps like Ahem, Microsoft Teams, which if you change, if you change your audio or video device, if you change your webcam, it, it won't detect them. You'll have to restart teams. Eh. Oh, I love stuff like that. I'm just wondering if anybody out there remembers all how fragmented connecting hardware used to be. Slots on your motherboard. Um, PCM CIA for network cards. Now all that stuff's just built in on the motherboard now. Uh, there's no more floppy disk zip drives. They had a brief glorious time and then disappeared. In fact, I have some friends that still have zip drives and, and disks and they can't read their old zip drives. It's kind of sad. Everything decays though. What are you going to do? Um, take a second for any questions. Uh, let, let's see. Um... Okay, uh, I think Sylvain Leroux, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Sylvain, um, is System hey. D a, a large part of your updated book? Yes. Yeah, in fact, Linux Cookbook 2nd Edition is greatly different from the first. Um, there's almost no networking how-tos. Uh, you know, networking is so well documented now, just like, okay, I just don't want to you know, waste space rehashing stuff. And it's a combination of old and new. Um, there, there were more new subsystems I could have covered, and but then you know, it would be such this huge giant book. So hopefully the ones I selected are, are uh, a useful selection that people actually use. And hi, Sylvain, I know you. <laughs> All right, moving on. So hot plug, USB, audio and video. Those are huge too. Again, now they just work. You don't have to think about them. Back in the early days, had to do all this configuration for every game I wanted to play for the audio and video. And uh, it, was, it was a real pain to set up. Had to do all this stuff manually. Um, any old timers here who remember configuring X windows manually? You didn't just plug in your you didn't just plug in your monitor. You had to set it up, 
And it was kind of arcane and weird, and it's something that people always struggled with. Well, now, okay, we have the DVI, HDMI. I mean, gosh, who knows what all they're going to come up with, maybe telepath. And if I had to manually configure a computer monitor now, I wouldn't even know where to start. It's, just, it's been so long since I've had to touch, touch that at all. Audio, that was another big mess back in the day. There were all these different audio systems. They were all incompatible. Um, Sound Blaster 16 was the original audio stack for Linux way back then. I mean, it was out there. It worked. It was, you know, it wasn't that great, but everybody used it, and it was well-supported on hardware. Then along came the open sound system, open source. Yay! And, you know, it was pretty good. And checking my notes again. See, I have to look sideways. I have two computers here to make this thing work. Right, ESD, that was the old GNOME and Enlightenment sound server. ARTS, A-R-T-S, K-D-E. And then ALSA was, A-L-S-A, was supposed to replace all of them. ALSA is still with us. The rest of these have all gone away. So even with Pulse Audio, I don't know if it depends on ALSA in some way or if it's just still there. And again, the kernel team and the people working on ALSA and Pulse Audio, there was a lot of cooperation with hardware vendors to make all this stuff work. Yes, NDIS wrappers for wireless. Oh my gosh, that was pain itself. I remember that. I mean, it was great. It let you use your, your wireless interfaces. I didn't know. It was a hack. It was a great hack. And I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, Sylvain mentions compiling drivers. In the first Linux cookbook, I spent a fair amount of space talking about customizing kernels, compiling modules and drivers and getting the functionality into it that you wanted. That's another thing I haven't had to do in ages. I mean, you can still do it if you want to, but it's nice to not have to. Lock device management. Oh my gosh, what, what could be better? Okay, again, USB, plug in your external drive, whatever kind it is. I still use DVDs and CDs. In fact, some of my friends make fun of me. Why don't you just do streaming? I like physical media. What the heck? Um, any other thing you want? You know, your webcam. I mean, there, I use uh, USB wireless interfaces on my PCs. It's just, and your whatever Linux you have, it probably has some simple way of configuring when you plug in a new device. Do you want it to auto mount? Do you want it to just sit there? Do you want to auto play? media, whatever. It, it, it's really great. Printing. Now, printing's been pretty much the same for quite a long time because of CUPS, Common Unix Printing System. Um, CUPS was originally an independent project. Uh, Matthew Sweet was the lead developer. You might remember his name. Um, CUPS replaced LPR, which was the BSD printing system and LP, the System 5 printing system. And those commands are still available on Linux, but they're part of CUPS now. I don't know if you can even get the old native LPR and LP setups anymore. Uh, Apple bought CUPS some years ago, and eh, you know, it, I don't know. I, I had the idea they weren't doing much with it, and I don't know what its status is now. I meant to look that up. Maybe somebody knows. At any rate, we're still using CUPS. The big improvement in CUPS is driverless printing, which I do talk about in the book. There, it's still a work in progress. So there's auto discovery um, to find printers on your network. They, they, the, the goals of driverless printing are to be able to roam freely between networks and easily find printers and then use them without having to install drivers. Now in its current state, it creates a driver. So it's not totally driverless, but you don't have to install cups. And this is really great for phones and tablets. I've tested it quite a bit and it works pretty well. Now your, pr your printers have to support this. There, there's two protocols. One's called Mopria, M-O-P-R-I-A, and AirPrint, which is Apple's um, printer discovery thingy. 
And as long as your printer supports those protocols, then it will work with the Cubs driverless printing. If it doesn't have those protocols, then it's not going to work. Firewalls. Yeah, just, <laughs> just kind of jumping ahead here. Um, my firewall tool of choice anymore is Firewall D. It is really awesome because it, um, so often you see firewall D how to's and they just kind of dismiss it as, oh yeah, this is just a simple baby firewall for really basic uses. Well, it's not. It's very sophisticated and it makes it pretty easy to do both simple firewalls and to create policies, right? Which you can't do with just plain old IP tables rules. And if you want to add your own custom IP tables rules, you can do that. So it's the best of all worlds. So you can set up all these different firewall scenarios, like for different interfaces. Um, and each one will have different rules. It can turn them on and off easily with IP tables. It's like you always had to come up with your own um, start and stop scripts. And if you wanted to restart your firewall entirely, then you had to write rules to, to, um, to turn off all your active rules and then turn them on again. And eh, eh, you know, it's too easy to make mistakes. And I'm really happy to have the computer handle all that stuff. Any questions at this time? Um, Carla, I let's see. I think uh, two people had raised their hand. One said, "Ah, I, 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 you know, didn't exactly mean to," which is totally okay. Um, Christoph um, raised their hand, and um, so I'm not sure if you know this. In Zoom, when you raise your hand, we can um, enable their audio so that they can, you know, convey a question um, live. Do you? Would you like to do that, or would you like oh, to maybe sure. save those ah. until the end? No, um, go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a few questions okay. now. So. All right, Christoph. So here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to enable your microphone. So on my end, on the admin side, I'm going to allow you to talk. So if you have a question or a comment, feel free to pose that or those to Carla. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And I just did that, Christoph. So you're live. I think you're muted. I'm going to ask Christoph to unmute. And okay. All right. I'm not hearing anything, Christoph. So if you want to pose that question or comment, feel free to do that. And if not, we'll go ahead and move forward. Yeah, I'll go ahead. And yeah. there, there's some qu questions in the question answer here. Remember getting win modems to work? Oh my gosh, yes, NDIS wrapper. Oh my, yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, I'm not sure if it's still as much of a problem back in the bad old days. Windows was able to cut costs on hardware by putting functionality into software. And it's, it's cool to be able to do that, right? I mean, it's not necessarily bad or good either way. It's just whatever you want to get done. But then it meant that this stuff only worked on Windows. And of course, everything was all closed and it was really hard to get Linux support. Yeah. Again, tech is 10%, people is 90%. People are just weird. Sylvain, Pulse Audio, great for the desktop. Okay, yeah, Jack, oh yeah, Book of Audacity, which I wrote is all about audio, high-end audio production on Linux. Um, I haven't, I haven't revisited this in some time. For a while there, I was doing some real serious audio, audio and video production with, with Linux and doing some pretty sophisticated work. Um, I always disabled Pulse Audio. It just kind of got in the way. Um, these days, you know, I don't know. They, they always tried to make Pulse Audio work nicely. With, with Jack and, and the other higher end audio tools. So I just don't know. What influenced me to write a book and also a second version, which was more painful, old computing or book processes? 
Well, book processes is definitely less painful. Uh, when I wrote my first two books for O'Reilly Linux Cookbook and Linux Networking Cookbook, they had this weird authoring system. Their whole publishing system was set up with Windows Sob software, right? So they 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 using Adobe Illustrator and other products, and and so I am writing Linux books, and I don't want to write them on Windows. By that time, I had pretty much. I was using Linux full time. I rarely needed to use Windows. And I just thought, why would I want to write a Linux book on Windows anyway? That just doesn't seem right. So, yes, now it is much better. Really small long way. They are a really good company. They have great people. They do a lot of work for you to make your book as good as it can be. So, definitely more painful is actually writing the thing because I work um, these tech books. I don't write them for the money. If I did, I'd be living in a box somewhere. I mean, they, they make enough to make it worthwhile, but I, I write them because I want to. I, there's, and I've seen this with, with so many people who are like kind of nerdy people. They learn things, they want to share them. Well, that's what I like to do. I learn things, I want to share them. I want to learn from other people. And I just really love um, the internet now. You can, you can learn about anything from anybody. It's just, it's just really great. So I'm not sure how much longer actual books will even serve a purpose. I just don't know. Times are changing. And okay, via emails. <laughs> well, you know, I like Kate and Nano. <laughs> All right. Another, and again, getting back to hardware. That's um, the software controls hardware. And sometimes I think maybe you know, some people forget about this. You can't just be pure software. It's always about the hardware. And a really big change in hardware has been most, ha most computer hardware these days, even the consumer level stuff, it's self-reporting. So you can query it. You can get all the specifications, all the information about it, and that's really slick. Back in olden times, if you wanted to know about um, any kind of wireless hardware, you had to look up the FCC filings where manufacturers are required to, to post their complete specifications. So they could, they could try to hide them as much as they could in every way possible and never tell you the hardware specs, but they still had to tell the FCC, so you could always get this information. Well, now it's just a few commands on Linux. You can extract all this information from the device itself. In fact, it's kind of a fun thing for me. I mean, you know, maybe I have weird ideas of fun, but I really like playing with the various hardware discovery commands, which are also included in, in Linux Cookbook Second Edition. LS, the LS command has all manner of hardware probing variants. There's LSHW, hardware, you know, list hardware, and uh, networking interfaces and all sorts of things. In fact, LSHW, I think, gives the most complete inventory of the hardware on your system. So if there's anything you need to know about your hardware, that's my, that's my first choice. And there's several others. And, you know, they're all great. They're simple commands. Just bink, run them, no muss, no fuss. Looking back at my notes. Gaming, are there any gamers here? Linux gamers, that is. Board gamers. <laughs> yeah, me too. I still play solitaire with actual decks of cards. I think doing it on a computer is just, just not quite optimal. <laughs> Linux has become absolutely fabulous for games. Uh, I mean, assuming you can find any that, that, that run on Linux. And there's, there's quite a few good ones. It's still not like PlayStation and Xbox and Windows games. And Linux is so much more efficient than Windows. I just, yeah, yeah Windows you can hardly get out of its own way. Video hop plug. So those are what I think are the biggest changes in Linux. Short story, you just install your software and start doing stuff. And I think it's wonderful. 
I don't know where the future is going to go. Linux runs on everything from little teeny tiny embedded devices to mainframes and everything in between. Uh, my current big fun is Linux on Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi 4B. This is the latest, most powerful one. This is con has considerably more computing power than all the previous Raspberry Pis, and it's still pretty cheap. And it makes a nice little internet gate gateway. You can use it as a specialized server. I mean, you, you could use it as a name server, for example, even running bind and or DNS mask if you, you prefer or land name service. It's got, got all the power you need to do things like that. You could run a local mail or web server. Um, I'm not sure you'd want it to run a public red web server getting a lot of traffic, but you know, who knows? It doesn't hurt to try. Yeah, there's a good question. Does desktop computing, Linux, Windows, Macs matter as much now, or is it mostly about mobile devices? That is really a very good question. I remember back in the day, I was tempted to do this whole thing in my cranky geezer voice, but I think that would become tiresome. Um, we were always sitting around complaining how how the PC, even Macs, which were, you know, they were pretty user friendly back then. In fact, back then you got this giant print manual with your Mac, with your Mac computer, and you could hack it. They encouraged you, open it up, get into the code, play with the hardware, have fun. Sure different from how they are now. At any rate, we were complaining how PCs were too complex for most people because they only needed a few things. They needed email, they needed internet, maybe an app or two, maybe a few games. They didn't need all the overhead and the complexity. Well, it's, we, we never got simple PCs, but we have phones, Android and iPhones and tablets. And it's, people live on their phones now. So you know, I, I, I think of, I think of, of uh, smartphones and tablets as the simple computers that we wanted way back when, except they're, they're really not that simple. They're powerful little pocket computers, but they're, they're easy for people to use. So yeah, they can do everything on their phones. In fact, some time ago, yeah, way back in the early 2000s, um, doing some surveys of what people were using around the world, there was this project, uh, I've forgotten the name, but yeah, they, they, were, they, they wanted to get into countries that didn't have a lot of infrastructure. And they found out that there, there were areas where there wasn't even reliable telephone service, let alone internet, but people had smartphones and they had cell service. And so they, they targeted their project towards that. I mean, there were people running their businesses off their phones in these little boondocks places. And, yeah, that, that was pretty amazing. So in some ways, I think maybe smartphones have done even more to bring computing to the masses, as they say, than uh, PCs. I'm gonna check for any more questions here. <laughs> the year of the Linux desktop yet, you know, people are always talking about that. And you know, when I was doing tech journalism, which started out fun because it was actually about the content and then it just became a vehicle to sell other things. And every year that you wanted, you wanted to generate some clicks, you'd write some dumb thing about, is it the year of the Linux desktop yet? The retail chain is the barrier. It's Windows and Apple. Microsoft and Apple have such a lock on the consumer market, and it, it's very expensive to, to um, serve up PCs at the retail level, right? They, they'd rather deal with business. I mean, well, Linux and SUSE. I work for SUSE, and both of them provide Linux workstations, but they're, they're, their thing is server stuff and businesses buying huge gobs of, gobs of stuff. System76, in my opinion, is the best independent Linux vendor now. The beautiful hardware, they'll customize it any way you want. Um, they have their own um, version of Ubuntu. It's called Pop OS. Very nice. You just plug it in and away you go. 
So even though installing Linux on a machine is really easy, if you know how, it's still quite a learning curve because you have to understand partitioning and UEFI bio stuff. And so that, that's still a pretty big barrier for a lot of people. So I, I don't know. I think Linux desktop is probably just going to be kind of a niche thing forever and ever. And I think someday PCs are going to be pretty small market share and just for people who really need all that power. Advice for people who feel like they have over in the Linux or aren't sure we're deep dive starting out trying to learn. Hey, buy my books, yay. Or uh, <laughs> the, the most helpful thing probably is finding some kind of community where you can hang out with people who are experienced and, and, and learn from them. Um, way back in the day, again, uh, I lived in the Portland, Oregon area, and there was a Linux user group that I went to. They had weekly meetings, and that was pretty cool. And I was usually the only woman there, but the guys were great. They, they were there to learn and exchange knowledge, and they'd bring in like giant old SCSI drives and stuff to show off. One guy had this huge cabinet all full of this old rack mount stuff that he actually hauled to the meeting so we could see it. And he plugged it in and had all these giant SCSI drives and that thing started up. It just sounded like a jet plane taking off and that was fun. But my best memory of that Linux user group, every now and then they'd have um, vendors come in and demonstrate some other stuff. Well, there was this guy, uh, he was kind of creepy. He was showing off their new hardware thingy and he had this slideshow. And the, you know, the buxom woman, not wearing very much, draped all over the devices. And about the third slide, the guys in the group are going, can you get her out of the way? I, we, we can't see. And I, I, I cherish that. That was great. So that's my advice. See if you can find some fellow Linux people to play with. Favorite distribution. Oh my gosh, I love all of them. I, I go between OpenSUSE and Ubuntu anymore. So my work computer, because I work for SUSE, of course, is OpenSUSE. And my personal one is Ubuntu. And sometimes I try something completely different just for the heck of it. For me, the more important thing is the desktop environment. My needs are pretty simple. I just want pretty backgrounds and application launcher. So I use XFC. Now people love GNOME, KDE, all the other great ones. But, uh, I'm an XFC girl all the way. Which distro plus? Oh, okay. So I answered that. So I'm going to wrap up here with a question. What do you know, any of you have any opinions on what you think the most important change in Linux is? I mean, I've told you all about mine. So I'm probably right, but you know, maybe you know something different. Ah, prefer shell or, oh yes, prefer, uh, preferred shell or file system. Um, Bash, I mean, it's just, I've tried some of the others, but you know, you get that muscle memory and Linux and actually any, you know, any general purpose computer operating system now is so complex i used to try to keep up with everything now i'm just like i don't care i'll just figure out the stuff that's important to me and the rest of it i'll just yeah it's just there um file system you know i i try all of them my main ones are ext4 xfs um sometimes i play with btrfs because um, of course that's a big one for susa and actually btrfs as cool as it is for my personal uses, it's overkill. I don't, I don't need anything that powerful and that featureful with all the snapshots and the copy on write and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just keep backups going all the time. So I'm not, you know, me, I'm not really interested in any kind of file system recovery and just restore from backup and start over. I'm getting to like XFS a lot. I can't really quantify why I just know that my what that, that when I'm when I'm using it 
I, I can't describe it. It just feels good. There, there's something different there. I haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, support for hardware. And again, yeah, support for lots of different hardware is wonderful now. And you got to give the kernel team and other Linux and open source developers a lot of credit for putting so much energy and time into working with hardware vendors to make it all work. WSL, that's, uh, what's WSL? Is that Linux on Windows? The WSL subsystem? Yeah, that's a good one. RPM, oh, that's another big one. Um, RPM and D DPKG are still with us. Um, package managers, but they're not dependency resolvers. So yeah, I totally. And again, that was another thing when um, apt and shoot, Red Hat changed the name, yum, okay. Yeah, apt and yum, when they were new, of course, there's this grumbling from experienced people. Ah, I don't need this automatic dependency resolving nonsense. Ah, I'll do it myself. Oh, poo, let the computer do it. End user facing and innovation things can actually be seen. Yeah, for me, end user innovation would be way more attention paid to user interface. Linux and open source still don't pay near enough attention to people who have some kind of dis disability, who can't see well, can't hear well. You know, it's all keyboard and mouse and you have to have good vision and hearing. Um, some people, they can't even sit up in a chair for very long. Now, this, this is something that I think that Linux and FOSS should really be leading in and we're not. And just user interface in general. Uh, okay, I don't mean to make anybody mad here, but GNOME drives me crazy with, with, with its interface. You know, they talk about the human interface guidelines and all this kind of stuff. Wonder when you go jump all over to find the right button to click, and when you don't have helpful hints, and actually most of them do this, they're where the you know button layout, um, labels on buttons just even knowing what to do. Some apps are really good at that, most of them aren't. In fact, MuseScore, I'm gonna type it in the chat here so you can see, that's score writing software. That's one of the crown jewels of open source. Oh, it is so beautiful. So you can create your music score, it's pretty. It will play, MuseScore will play your notes for you. And you can just pick it up and start doing stuff without really studying the documentation. Okay, I'm looking at Q&A again. Docker, yeah, yeah, containers. Docker, though, I've always kind of wondered about it. It's like, we already, okay, yeah, you know, containers, LXC, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, Docker is huge. And in fact, um, on the doc team at SUSE, we, we use Docker a fair bit because our our documentation management tool chain is very huge and complex. And for new employees, or if you're reinstalling, it's quite a lot of work. So that's just all bundled into a container now, just bip and there you go. Christine, hi. The fact that it now just works out of the box but with all the power of configuration still available because it's Linux under the hood. That's the biggest gain to me. Yes, I totally agree, Christine. In fact, my favorite thing, is how we can have the command line and the graphical desktop all there at the same time. I love it. And if your graphical environment gets screwed up, you just do the control alt F2 or whatever the is, and then you're dropping to the console. So even if your graphical environment's totally messed up, usually your console will still work. Snaps and flat packs. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot about those. Yes. And they're still babies. They still have their problems. Snap drives me crazy sometimes because it bogs down my system. And then, but the good news is it's managed by system D. So I can turn it off or just restart it without having to reboot the whole system. Virtualization at the hardware and OS levels. Absolutely. For, uh, for my work at SUSE, I, I'll, I'll get five or six VMs going all at the same time. And it, 
And, you know, if I, if I didn't have those, it would be hard to do my job. I have all these elaborate little networks set up and all these different servers going and I can test authentication. I can test, oh, I can just test everything. Interesting. Okay, here's a comment in the chat. A blind man who came to a lug meeting and found Unity 7 more user friendly with a screen reader, even compared to Mac. That's that's good to know. I wonder if that's on purpose or if they just got lucky. If that was a purposeful design decision, that's really great. Any thoughts on WireGuard? I'm sorry, I do not have any thoughts on WireGuard. I don't even know what it is. Some kind of security tool. System D versus, oh, yeah. Well, if you heard me at the beginning, you probably got the idea that I do like System D. And uh, I am not unhappy to see the old INITs go away. There's so much more. And, you know, System D, it manages services and processes from start to shut down. It'll start them up when they need them on demand. It'll shut them down when they're not being used. I mean, I, I think it's really excellent. How are we doing on our time here, Todd? Um, okay, yeah. No, I think we're right about at, at the end. We're at about 103, which um, that puts us right at the top of the hour. So we always try to wrap up um, in a, about an hour. Uh, we know people are joining us from different time zones, right? That's one of the one of the beauties of um, uh, being able to do this virtually. People from all over the world and all over the United States can join us. So people are coming and joining us at different times of the day, but a lot of people are working. So a lot of people uh, you know, wanna join us at the beginning of their work day, maybe that are on the West Coast or at lunchtime if they're on the East Coast, or maybe at the end of the work day too. So maybe they only have an hour uh, to actually join us to kind of carve out of their day. Maybe they'll eat something as they're um, you know, learning something, uh, which is always a good combination and, and you know, a, a good use of time we found. So anyway, um, long answer to a short question, Carla, we're right at about the end. Um, so look, this has been very engaging. Uh, obviously, a lot of questions and comments. This is a topic that we love and you've really done a great job. You've done a really, really wonderful job. Um, Carla, do you, uh, how might people contact you if they would like to communicate with you? Um, if you want to maybe drop your Twitter handle or maybe um, something like that over in chat, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but in, you know, if people are interested in following up with you or learning more or maybe touching base somehow, um, how might they do that? Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter a lot. And so there I am. There you go. Perfect. That's one Actually, thing I didn't I drop over there. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm going to check that and just make sure that's the right thing. Yeah, it looks right to me. Yay, there's, <laughs> yes, there I am with my kitty cat. All right. Yes, that's, that, that's my, that's my uh, background on, on Twitter. My, my literacy cat, Duchess says, read books. Um, Carl, one final question from Lynn, Lynn Boyle. Um, he said, do you plan to release a new Linux net networking cookbook? I've been talking to my O'Reilly editor about that. We've been, we've been discussing different ways. Um, in the olden days of print books, they wanted big fat tech books that looked good on bookstore shelves. That era is pretty much gone. So now we're thinking about small specialized topics. So the answer is sort of yes. Networking has, uh, has changed. Well, actually hasn't changed all that much except for IPv6, which the US is still kind of very slow to uptake. So yeah, I can give you a definitive maybe. Fair enough. Okay, so I think that's the final question that we'll take. Um, let me wrap this up uh, with just a couple of points. Um, Carla, thanks again for speaking. Super, super nice of you. Uh, again, I, I warned you, I thank you 7,000 times here. Um, and I've still got a bunch to go, right? So let me see if I can get those in in the, in the last minute or two. 
just joking. Uh, <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, but thank you very, very much. Great job. Again, obviously a great topic, very well done uh, based just on, you know, the number of comments and the level of engagement that we saw. Um, again, to everyone that's joining, thank you so much. Thanks for helping us make 2021 a great year. It's been a challenging year. It's been a different year, again, on the heels of 2020, which was a really different year, but it, it's been wonderful. And it's really because of our community. So without you, we wouldn't be able to do everything that we do. And to each and every one of you, thank you. Um, you know, when we see in person, hopefully we'll be able to see in person face to face here soon coming up in 2022. I'll give you a fist bump, maybe even a cool hug, not a weird weirdo hug, uh, but certainly kind of a, you know, kind of a cool, we have a tendency to do that our entire team. We just gener genuinely appreciate our community and human beings. Carly, you said something that I agree with 10,000% and you repeated it a couple of times. The technology is nice, but at the end of the day, this is about people and human beings. And uh, we firmly believe that and have from the very beginning. That's really what this all comes down to. After everything else is said and done, what is left is human beings. And, you know, we're all just trying to make it in a very big world. And we've always tried to focus on the human side of this and make it fun and engaging and just nice, just create a really nice environment for people to communicate in and educate themselves in, et cetera. So many, many thanks to you all. I also wanna thank Christine Hall. Um, Christine Hall, um, I know she posed a question and, and Carly, you referenced Christine. She's a wonderful friend of all things open and she helped to make this possible, right? She actually made the initial connection between us and you, Carla. So, uh, and she also um, uh, has a wonderful open source platform called Phosphorus. And I dropped a link over in the chat stream. So I would encourage you to check out that website. She does a wonderful, wonderful job and has for a long time. It's a, I read it religiously uh, and really, really great stories on that particular platform. I wanna thank Fidelity Investments um, uh, for being a sponsor and along with Camunda and Alma Linux. Alma Linux and Camunda spoke uh, as we got started, but those three companies really helped to make this possible. And I very much want to appreciate that. A number of others as well, uh, but those three specifically. Um, the giveaways, I dropped the link over um, in the chat stream. Uh, if you're interested in Carla's book, please let us know there or an ATO t-shirt, please let us know. Click on that link. It's just a WUFU form. You can indicate interest there. Um, the next meetup, Tuesday, January the 18th. So we'll see you in 2022. That's a Tuesday. And that meeting meetup is going to be in the evening in downtown Durham, North, Durham, North Carolina. So if you're in the RTP area of North Carolina or even in the surrounding area, join us at that meetup on Tuesday, January the 18th, starting at about six o'clock. And we are going to try to live stream that and we are going to record it as well. And again, just to repeat one thing that I said, maybe for the third time, we are, we have recorded this. So we are recording today. So um, we'll notify you via social media and via email and through Meetup uh, when that recording is available. And we're going to try really hard to have it available by the end of this week or at the very latest by the beginning of next week. So all that said, um, Carl, any, any final words, any, any, anything you'd like to say before we wrap up and end, end it? Just thank you, Todd. This was great. And thank you to everyone who came here. Y'all are super cool. The, look, I'm biased. This is a really great community. People are genuinely nice and genuinely care about human beings. So uh, again, that has always transcended the technology and, you know, the tech is nice. We all love it, uh, obviously. But uh, again, at the end of the day, it's about people. So this community certainly re reflects that. Um, so anyway, Carla, thank you very much. So happy holidays to everyone, wherever you happen to be. And uh, if you need us for anything, if we can ever help you over the break, until we see you again on January the 18th, send us an email at info at allthingsopen.org, info at allthingsopen.org. But we look forward to seeing you in the new year. And thanks again for joining. Take care. Bye-bye. Carla, thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.